pointed out, and I'm one of the archaeologists for London with Historic England. Um, I have a long association with London and the river, um, and Nat has been kind enough to invite me to speak here um, a number of times. And she invited me this year, and I thought, they must be sick to death of me. I've spoken about scientific dating. I've spoken about the site at Irith. I've spoken about dead people. Last year, um, I sang my song of joy um, about the river. Um, and I enjoyed myself so much, I thought I cannot indulge myself in this manner anymore. Um, and this is the ninth year, and it's, nine is a very interesting number. It's one I like because I'm actually slightly obsessive about numbers, and so it's three of three. And this is a time, again, for me not to be self-indulgent and talk about what I want to talk about, but I want to celebrate everyone in this room, um, and also those who are flashing up on the screen behind who are not in the room and who have done fantastic work. So I thought about this and I thought, right, let's have, let's have a little bit of fun, but let's make a serious point. There are people in this room and there are people who have been on the foreshore who have done amazing things. So firstly, everyone needs to be congratulated for that, but we will pick out a few individuals. But before we do that, um, I'm going to tell you a fairy story. So I want you to digest your cake, sit back, feel comfortable, and I'm just going to set the scene a little bit as to how we've all got here and to reflect upon not just these nine years, because I'm afraid to say there were a few years before we got to the beginning of the nine years. So I'll start my fairy story. Once upon a time, there was a wise man of the river who loved the river and who studied the river and who cared about the archaeology on the river. But this wise man of the Thames was nervous and concerned because there was a great deal of history from that river that told the stories and sang the songs of the river that was being lost. And um, great and brilliant though the wise man was, he knew he couldn't do it by himself. And he worried about this for a long time and wrote some books and published some papers. But there came a day when he thought to himself, I have a dream. <laughs> I have a dream that one day we shall be able to train everyone to do this, to love the river as I do, to record the river as I do, to share the knowledge and to share the stories of the river as I do. And in order to achieve this dream, I will seek for gold to make this happen but I will need people to work with me. I will seek to entice a colleague to come and share her love of the river. And so it came about that the wise man of the river found the wise woman of the river, someone that had demonstrable experience and strong interpersonal skills and could fill in <laughs> risk assessments. <laughs> and so it came to pass that the wise man of the Thames and the wise woman of the Thames obtained their bags of gold, um, developed their strong interpersonal skills and fulfilled the need to prepare risk assessments and created a programme. And that was nine years ago. And since then, they trained these people. And the wise man and the wise woman of the river said, these will be our people and we shall name them frogs. <laughs> And here you all are. It's a fairy tale because the bags of gold were indeed found. Over 700 people have said, I want to go out in the rain and the mud and the sewage, and I wish to draw pictures of rotting bits of timber. <laughs> I wish to pick up battered bits of oyster shell that have holes in. And the wise man and the wise woman of the river tell me that these are important, and no one has yet explained why they're important. <laughs> so it's a fairy story. There were bags of gold, and it's an astonishing thing. And everyone in this room should be extremely proud of themselves for being a part of the translation of this fairy story from a myth into reality. So this is why I'm standing here and I'm going to give a few certificates away and the highly prized Historic England swag bag. But before, <laughs> before we do that, 
There are no prizes today for the wise man and the wise woman of the river, who I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about, because there isn't a prize that's great enough to award them for what they've done. Um, what they've got is something that all archaeologists hope to achieve, and very few of us manage it. Um, we've had a great success, and I didn't say we, it's not me, um, they have had a great success. They've delivered the most astonishing project, um, and they've created a lasting legacy. And this is something actually that very, very few archaeologists do. The legacy is in all of you, it's in all the work that will carry on. And it's something I must admit that when I sat in the planning meetings for getting the big bags of gold out of the Heritage Lottery, I was nervous that such a legacy would actually ever happen. And it did happen, and it continues to happen, and it will continue to happen. So they don't get the Historic England goodie bag. What I would like to do is ask you to give an enormous round of applause, but also I want some foot stamping and a bit of whooping for <laughs> Gustav and for Natalie. <laughs> Because you don't get the. Yeah. Moving on, moving on. Um, I called for nominations in five categories, uh, and I'd like to thank those that uh, that wrote in to me. Um, now, there's a bit of science and education in this as well. The categories I named are all actually named after real frogs. Um, I restrained myself from writing in Latin on the certificates, but only just. Get the right piece of paper. Right. Um, now, unfortunately, one of the winners is not here today, um, and that is the person that I'm awarding the Burrowing Frog Award to. A particularly fine picture of the Burrowing Frog. Everyone's going to get um, a nice certificate in a, in a frame. And the Burrowing Frog, um, this was perhaps... Um, one that many people could have been awarded, but this person was nominated a number of times. The burrowing frog, as you can imagine, is for sheer hard work, enthusiasm, endeavor, and getting really stuck into the mud. And the burrowing frog award goes to Tina Larkham. Darwin's frog. Now, again, you'll understand from the name that this is about some words falling apart. Um, this is about science. So, this is for the frog <laughs> that has shown uh, the most scientific interest, the most geeky ness. Um, and the Darwin's frog goes to Guy Blue. Do you wish to say anything? Thank you very you are much. A letter, right? <laughs> oh, you, you get the oh, wow. historic England. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ah, oh, this is a fun one. Yeah, we had quite a few, and again, the um, this one was <coughs> unanimous in all the nominations that came in for this one. This is the Hip Pocket Frog Award. And again, these are all real frogs. Uh, and I've stolen this illustration off the internet from a book about hip pocket frogs. One thing that you'll all be aware of and you'll be seeing through these photos is that some people on the foreshore get really covered in mud. I'm one of these people. I cannot go down on the foreshore without getting covered in mud. My face gets covered in mud, everything gets covered, my bum normally gets covered in mud when I fall in. 
Um, and some people manage to come off the foreshore after a day's work looking surprisingly stylish to the extent that some of us uncharitably might think that they've not worked as hard as others. <laughs> but some manage to maintain their style, their dress sense, the accoutrement pockets that they might have, um, and manage to um, do a fantastic day's work and um, maintain their style and their demeanour and their appearance as well. Um, and the hip pocket for other ward goes to someone who has managed to um, be well dressed, well tooled up, I think was the phrase I used, possibly not the most appropriate one. Uh, I don't believe that this person has been carrying um, an armory, shall we say. Anyway, this was again a, a, a unanimous decision that Martin Hatton gets the hip pocket of Robert Ward. Stylish and tooled up. Brilliant. Well, the mud bag boots normally. Well, this was not what everyone thought. So. Yeah. Oh, and the. Uh, and a bag. And Excellent. the historic. Thank you very much. Did I, historic, did I mention that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. This is a lovely one. This is the glass frog, which looks beautifully like Kermit the frog. Now, um, we all know, we all know that we are serious archaeologists. We love what we do, which is learning more about human and past societies. Finds are incidental. We're not interested in pretty objects. We're not interested in treasure. Coins are boring. They're out of context. They don't tell us really anything. Um, so these are, these are fripperies that as serious scholars we have no interest in at all. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so this award um, is for the frog that has an ability to find material, to understand material, to research material, to understand how these objects do relate to a site, whether they're in context, whether they're not in context, uh, and has gone above and beyond the straightforward recording of material to really get to grips with the artefacts that are coming off and the ability also because again you know I can spot a bone at 100 paces but I can rarely spot anything else and you'll all know that some people have their eye in for some things some people have their eye in for others um, and there are some that are simply very very good at this um, and as this morning's talk showed James Ward is one of those people so the glass frog for exemplary finesness goes to James. <laughs> is the wood frog, which is less glamorous than the glass frog, which is bright green. This is a lovely brown one, as you would expect for a wood frog award. As I said, there are some of us that don't care about trinkets and coins and baubles and pilgrim badges of Thomas a Beckett. <laughs> some of us like wood, some of us like timber, some of us like jetties, some of us like fish traps, some of us like rotten old posts that we don't know what date they are or what they are at all. Um, but wood is something that we all work with extensively on the foreshore, um, and it does tell us a great deal. Um, many of us have had the privilege of working with Damien and listening to Damien over <coughs> years, um, and know how much we can learn from what looks like an unprepossessing lump of timber on the foreshore, when you can actually see that it's part of a boat when you suddenly realise and you see that structure at Charlton and you think, well, it looked like a square box load of timbers to me, but someone says it's really part of an enormous vessel. Crikey, 
or you see a small, tiny twig, and it gradually unfolds and unfolds and unfolds and becomes a basket. Or you have a few tiny, tiny stumps of timber, and you suddenly think, that's an Anglo-Saxon fish trap. Oh, look, there's another Anglo-Saxon fish trap. Raggy, there's another Anglo-Saxon fish trap. And what this project has shown over the years is that there is a vast amount of material surviving, and we have learnt staggering amounts of so many kinds of structure and of boat <coughs> and of artefact. Um, some of my favourite sites, quite frankly, are the wooden ones. Um, I yield to no one in my love of the Bronze Age thing, whatever it is, at Vauxhall. I'd love to know one day before I die what that thing was built for, but in the meantime, I will simply love it for what it is. Uh, and I'm quite relieved, actually, to say that I'm not the only person that finds wood and timber basket work to be absolutely fascinating. There are a number in this room, um, and one of those is Melvin Dresner. Certificates again. Thank you for the nominations and congratulations to those taking away their rather silly um, but quite fun prizes. But this was a serious thing to do. Um, I don't know how many person hours have been undertaken. Thousands and thousands and thousands. And thousands, and thousands. Yeah. Without the work of the frogs in this room that have been trained, without the work of their friends, without the encouragement of their families. <laughs> Um, this work couldn't have been achieved. We would have nothing of the records that we have. We do have commercial projects. We've just heard from Team 2100. We've heard from Tideway. But these projects look at very small stretches of the foreshore in very specific areas. What you have done as a body of frogs over the last nine years, and hopefully for the next 90 years, um, is record and monitor and revisit and re-record and re-monitor and re-record and you have shown through these records and through these data the changing nature of the foreshore. We've seen today that many of these sites are eroding at a rate of knots. We've also seen, I'm greatly relieved, um, that some sites like the fish traps at Barnes um, are still there, reasonably intact. So I simply wanted myself to say thank you for doing all this. I have a statutory responsibility to look after archaeology, uh, and like the wise man and woman of the Thames, I know that you have to have people to do this. You have to have a lot of people to do this, um, and you've done this. You've done this without pay, without reward. You've done it for the fun of it. You've done it for the love of it. You've done it for the biscuits. Um, <laughs> and you've done it for the sheer joy of discovery. So I thank you all for that um, and hope to see you next year. Thank you very much.